Good evening, everyone. Welcome to the Earth Day Every Day webinar program. Uh, tonight, we'll be talking about black bears in New Jersey. Uh, just so you know, this presentation is being recorded and will be available later. Uh, my name is Sal Mangifico. I work for Rutgers Cooperative Extension. Uh, Cooperative Extension is the part of Rutgers University that does public education. And we're able to present programs like this for you all. So this, the Earth Day Everyday webinar series is a collaboration of Earth Day Everyday and the Rutgers Marine Extension Program. So I have a few of my colleagues online with me this evening who are part of the Earth Day Everyday team. Steve Yerjo, Michelle Bacchus, Amy Rowe, and Jean Epifan. You can go ahead and go to the next slide. So just a, a couple of notes on how things are gonna work this evening. The, the chat feature is disabled uh, for viewers. However, if you have questions, please type them into the Q&A, which will look like either on your screen or on your phone, will look like, um, two speech bubbles together, Q&A, and we'll hold those questions till the end and we'll address as many as we can at that point. Also, um, later before the end of the talk, we'll be launching a poll, just some questions about what you thought of tonight's presentation and what you learned. Um, however, as part of that, the university does consider that human subjects research, since we are collecting data on you. The slide in front of you contains some information about that. Of course, the poll is voluntary, uh, but we do appreciate your feedback on things. Go to the next slide. It, and finally, um, Rutgers Cooperative Extension is an equal opportunity program provider. There's some information on your screen there if you'd like some more information about uh, that topic or if you have any concerns that you'd like to have addressed. So with those preliminaries, I'd like to introduce our speaker for this evening, uh, Joseph Paulin with Rutgers University. For over 25 years, Joe has collaborated with partners to balance the needs of communities, livelihoods, and economies with natural resource conservation. He's worked with Rutgers Cooperative Extension, the U.S. Peace Corps, uh, NOAA Office of National Marine Sanctuaries, specifically on issues involving threatened, endangered, and abundant wildlife, including now crocodiles, humpback whales, American black bear, white-tailed deer, and Canada geese. In addition to his work in New Jersey, Joe has spent over 12 years living and working with communities in Madagascar, Hawaii, American Samoa, and the Philippines, where he has trained and led teams in developing conservation management plans, studies on human-wildlife interactions, and outreach programs to reduce human-wildlife conflicts. So I think with that being said, thank you, Paul, for, uh, sorry, thank you, Joe, for speaking this evening. And um, I will turn it over to you. Thanks, everyone. All right. Thanks, Sal. Good evening, everyone. It's uh, great to be here. Everybody uh, likes talking about black bears. We're going to go through some of the state's uh, population research, as well as some of the human dimensions research that we've done at Rutgers it actually looks at how personal experiences with bears affects tolerance as well as support for various management options. Now, just to give you a little more background about myself, I've lived in places like Madagascar, where I've worked with the endangered Madagascar bighead turtle, as well as sacred crocodiles uh, around a lake in the northwest part of the country in a, a forest preserve, where those crocodiles were seen to guard the ancestral spirits that resided in the lake and enforced a series of taboos that actually were quite in line with conservation initiatives in the area. I've also spent 10 years in the Pacific Islands working in both Hawaii and American Samoa, again looking at the interface between culture and conservation, doing anything from having to remove grounded fishing vessels that were destroying important reef and community fishing areas, that people relied on to put food on the table every day, to doing marine mammal and humpback whale conservation, dealing with emerging issues like offshore wind and aquaculture, as well as, uh, if you look in the upper left-hand corner here, that's actually specialized divers that we brought into the islands 
to do a crown of thorn starfish removal. Crown of thorns, if you think of it, they're kind of like the deer of the reef in this area of the Pacific Islands. They were eating all the reef. The fish would go away. Then people didn't have food to put on the table. So these are just some of the species and important issues that I've worked on with communities around the world. My work here in New Jersey since the late 90s has focused mostly on the interactions uh, with people and wildlife, particularly black bear, which we're going to be talking about tonight, white-tailed deer, and Canada geese. Now, getting into black bears in New Jersey, just to give you a little bit of background in case you're not familiar, black bears were nearly extirpated in New Jersey in the 1900s. This was due to primarily because of habitat reduction for clearing of land, as well as the indiscriminate killing of bears. Because the populations declined so much, they were actually in protective status as a game animal species back in the 1950s. There were a few hunts uh, back in the 1960s, but so few bears were taken during those hunts, it led the State Wildlife Agency to actually close the season in the early 1970s. Now, from the 1970s into the early 2000s, as the bear population recovered, habitat recovered, and bear wandered back into New Jersey from New York and Pennsylvania, you can see in the upper left, we had a good bear population in the northwest part of the state. Back then, in the late, uh, by the early 2000s, the bear estimates in that area, pretty much north of Route 80 and west of 287 in the, in the two research zones, were about 3,000 bears. Now, since then, bears have spread out, expanded their range uh, throughout the state, and they've now been spotted in all of the counties in New Jersey. Now, because of this uh, expansion of the bear range, People are, you know, we have the most densely human populated state in the entire country. So the bears were interacting with people more than ever before. Uh, this led the state to, as well as the university, to really start increasing black bear education efforts. And the state's had a, a really strong program now going back more than 20 years, going out doing black bear awareness training, as well as educating the public about the research that had been going on, as well as uh, management activities. Now that research, population research, goes back to the 1980s and the state biologists have uh, handled individual over several thousand bears in that time period. But the population studies evolved uh, telemetry work where people are going out radio tracking collared bears, looking at bear movements, looking at home ranges, female home ranges up in uh, northwestern part of the state are about three square miles. This also involves uh, trapping research twice a year where trained biologists will actually go out. They capture bears typically on an Aldrich uh, snare. It's a cable snare that catches the bear around the wrist and holds it here. You can see uh, one here has been captured. It's quite content. The bear is then anesthetized. Um, it's put to sleep with drugs. It's pretty much like when we go into surgery and have to have anesthesia because you wanna make sure that the bear is not aware when the research activities are going on. Now, while the bear is anesthetized, it'll get tags in its ears with numbers on it. This isn't so in the event that the bear is recaptured, we know where the bear has been captured in the past and how far it's traveled. The bear also gets a tattoo that corresponds with one of those ear tags on the inside of the lip. Now, the reason for the tattooing is the male bears during the summertime, during the, the reproductive season, when they're fighting, sometimes they actually will rip each other's earlobes off. So this way with the tattoo, if the bear any, has lost an ear tag, regardless of how it actually happened, they'll be able to check that number and see that the bear has been previously captured. There's also blood samples taken. Um, this is for various work that's done, some of which at East Stroudsburg, who's doing DNA analysis. Uh, as well as looking at potential diseases in black bears, and various body measurements are taken. Now, we're we'll focusing over to uh, winter den work here, but if you look closely at this picture, this is people getting ready to weigh a, a black bear, which is actually done whenever possible during any of the research activities. Male black bears in the state average about 400 pounds, but can go over 700 pounds. Females average about 200 pounds and can have been uh, weighed in at over 500 pounds. Now, 
Cubs in litter size in, in New Jersey is typically it averages out about three cubs per litter, which is higher than the rest of the country. Although you can see here in this photograph, there have been bears documented having five and even six cubs. So very successful reproduction. Just to show you a couple of the different types of dens we have in New Jersey, there's kind of a, a rock cavern, which a lot of us think about when we're thinking about bears denning up for the wintertime. If you notice in this picture in the, the lower right in the background, you can see the house. All of these dens I'm about to show you are in close proximity to humans. This is actually another popular type of den. It's a brush pile. It's just off the edge of somebody's driveway in their front yard in northern New Jersey. And then, of course, behind uh, this house on a deck here, which is another place that we've found some dens over the years. Other types of, of denning sites include hollowed out trees, sometimes standing trees, as well as ground nests. Sometimes they'll just dig a depression into the ground and actually get covered up with snow for the winter time. Can they, they're not true hibernators. They don't have a significant reduction in body temperature. They go into a state called torpor. So if it's a warm day or if somebody's making uh, noise around them, they could actually, you know, wake up and actually walk around a little bit. So I wanted to show you a picture of these cubs. The cubs are typically, you know, cubs are born around January. At birth, they're around a pound or so each. Now, about a, within a year and a half later, this is how big they get. So this is probably shortly before the mother bear here, you can see is collared, is going to push these bears out on their own. They'll typically stay with the mother bear or the sow about a year and a half. Then she'll force them out to find their own ranges while she's getting ready to breed again. The breed, females will breed every other year. Uh, urban bears is also a situation where uh, data will be collected. You can see this one as ear tags and a radio collar. In an urban situation, this is typically where you're going to see a barrel trap used. This is the only type of situation where you're really usually going to see a bear that would be captured if it got into that urban area and couldn't get it and relocated. Other than that, bears are not captured and relocated in New Jersey. One other part uh, of the research involves taking a, a small tooth or a premolar from behind the canine tooth. And the reason that the biologists knew this is that the tooth actually has growth rings in it like a tree. So you can actually age the bear based on the rings inside that tooth and if it's a sow, you can tell which year she's had cubs because the ring will actually be thinner there. So that's why they take that premolar or tooth, which is something we asked about later this evening. So again, as we got into this expansion with bears starting to you know, really show up again in the northwest part of New Jersey and moving throughout the state and interacting with people more than ever before, if you looked at the mid-90s, Kind of the, the negative interactions of reported conflicts between people and bear were only a couple of hundred. But by the time we got into the early 2000s, they got up over 3,000. So quite a, quite a difference there as the bear numbers increased. And back in around 2003, December 2003, I'm sure some of you remember, that's when bear hunting was reinstituted to try to control the bear population and keep, keep the bear population steady. Now, you also may remember that it was very controversial and still to this day is arguably one of the most controversial wildlife issues in the state, where we often see in the popular media and on TV very strong opinions both for and against the use of lethal management in a bear management strategy. So again, people against it as well as for it, because some people did not want the bears, and these photos are back around that 2003 hunt, they didn't want the bears coming into the yard, especially when their children were out in the yard playing. So we instituted a mail survey. We wanted to see, all right, we're, we're, we're hearing about these very strong opinions, but if we're gonna go out and do a random survey, which we did, what do the majority of people think? We actually did this survey. We got over uh, 1,200 responses. It was done in areas that were considered high bear density, where there was a lot of bears. And at the time, and still today, the densities are about three, pair, three bears per square mile in this area. And our study townships north of 80 and west of 287 were Vernon, West Milford, and Jefferson. And then between 78 and Route 80, 
we did what were called our low density areas. So that's where bears existed, but they existed at lower numbers and weren't interacting with people uh, as often. Now we wanted to look at a couple of things in particular, personal experiences that people were having with bears at the time, how that influenced or predicted tolerance, as well as support for various lethal and non-lethal management strategies and options involving modifying human behavior. So the next couple of graphs or series of graphs, it's called a potential for conflict in index. It doesn't necessarily mean there's a conflict going on. It's just a way to look at survey data and kind of visually represent it. So in a lot of the cases we're going to be looking at, the bottom of the vertical axis is strongly disagree. That line going across the middle is neutral and up at the top is strongly agree. Now, red represents our high density group and gold represents the low density group. Now, the smaller the bubble and the smaller the number, that means the more agreement there was within the members of that group. And then the center of each one of the bubbles, that represents the mean or the average for that particular group. So the first question we we're looking at is how do people feel about bears in the state? Now, and you can see here, whether it was the high density group in red or the low density group in gold, everybody, regardless of their level of experience, felt very positive about the bears, which is a great thing. That's the way we want people to feel. Now, when we're looking here at lethal and non-lethal management, asking people, do you believe there should be a combination of lethal and non-lethal management options used to manage bears? Again, both groups were in agreement on this. As you can see, both bubbles are in the agree. And this is you know, where we're talking about hunting to reduce bear numbers, um, as well as modifying human behavior and proper storage of garbage to try to decrease the chances of attracting bears. Both groups, people in both groups were very much opposed to doing nothing to manage the bears and felt that something needed to be done. Primarily, most people felt that it needed to be a combination of lethal and non-lethal, which is the way that the state had gone with management activities. Now, when we look into support specifically for lethal options that were represented, so we had hunting to reduce bear numbers permits to remove bears that were causing agricultural damage. And if you actually look at this photograph in the center down here at the bottom, this is actually a house, this kind of little dot here. And this is a huge cornfield. Now, if you look at where the cornfield changes colors, where it looks like there's circles, that's where bears had actually gone in, rolled around, and were eating the corn. This is something that's that's still going on today, and I'm actually going to tell you about a study where we're looking into that later. And then the other option that we're asking people about was killing bears, posing a threat to public safety. You see here, this young boy was actually a, a boy in Pennsylvania that had been uh, scratched by a bear. Now, as far as looking into non-lethal options, we were asking people about options that both available and were not available. So if something like reproductive controls, which the science has shown not to be effective and was ruled out for bears in New Jersey back in the early 2000s, because it was often talked about at public meetings and in the popular media as if it was available, we included it even though it was not available in any work, whether regardless of species that would involve any type of reproductive controls would actually be considered a research population, require a research permit in New Jersey. It would be require approval of the state wildlife agency as well as the Fish and Game Council. Uh, harassment techniques. Um, the, bear, the state wildlife program had previously employed the use of some black mouth yellow cur dogs for research purposes. They were also used in what's called aversive conditioning or harassment. So say for example, a bear was getting into a neighborhood and getting into somebody's garbage cans. If the state biologists were out in the area with the dogs, they could take the dogs, run the dogs after them. It's supposed to be a negative experience and ideally it would keep the bear from coming back to that area. Um, the thing that we talked about is trap and relocate. Again, trap and relocate is only going to happen really in New Jersey now. In the case of urban bears or bears that get caught in urban areas, 
then they would be captured if they were able to and removed and moved to the nearest wildlife management area. And it would be using one of these barrel traps that you see here in the lower right. The point for modifying human behaviors, again, um, as we see in various studies across wildlife species, when you're talking with people who you know have and haven't had experience with the various wildlife, this is always gets some of the most, uh, the highest levels of support amongst the survey participants. So here, if you look at modifying be be uh, behaviors like properly storing your garbage so it doesn't track bears, very high level of support, as well as enforcing regulations prohibiting feeding bears, and then as well, uh, outreach and education efforts teach people ways to reduce the likelihood of conflicts with bears or attracting bears. All of these very popular. And I want to point out now, while we're looking at these bubble graphs, this actually involves people who have had experiences with bears and haven't had experiences with bears. So these bubble graphs actually represent the popularity contest, so uh, popularity contest, so to speak. When we get into some predictive models that we're going to see in a few minutes, those models actually focus on the experience. So bear experiences, we looked at threats. This is one of the ways that our study was pretty unique and new from other studies that had been done with black bears um, in, around the country. Typically, when scientists would go out and ask people about, you know, the, about what they thought about black bears, it wasn't about actual personal experiences with the bears. It was about concerns about those experiences. So if you look at studies in New York at Cornell with Bill Seamer, they had done studies involving experience, but people who had actually felt threatened, they were talking about two or 3% of the people that participated in their surveys. If you looked at uh, Zajac in Ohio, 85% of the people that actually responded to their surveys hadn't even actually seen a bear in Ohio. Here in New Jersey, when we were talking about threats, people having, you know, feeling their own personal safety was threatened or their child's safety or pet safety was threatened, we were looking at over 30% of the people who responded to the survey had actually felt or experienced these types of threats. So this was something new that we hadn't seen in the scientific research before. As far as seeing bears, our levels of people seeing bears in New Jersey throughout the state, in their neighborhood, seeing bear cubs, extremely high, especially in those red or high density bear areas, but still pretty high as well in the, the lower density bear areas. And then again, nuisance behavior, bears getting into people's garbage and bears getting into bird feeders, still over you know 60% and getting close to 70% of our respondents for bears actually getting into people's garbage. Now, what we did with all those survey questions is we did this kind of analysis called an exploratory factor analysis. And what that does is it takes the survey questions. So the graphics on your screen right now are representing a different, different survey questions. For example, somebody felt feeling themselves or their child or their pet safety had been threatened. Had they seen bears throughout the state in their neighborhood or seeing cubs? And had they, had they experienced those nuisance behaviors like bears getting into garbage and bears getting into bird feeders? After we did this uh, factor analysis that grouped like questions, we ended up with three different factors here about people ex people's experiences. So it was those experiences where people had been threatened with, that we just talked about, seeing bears in different situations, and then again, those nuisance behaviors. Now, we also asked questions about tolerance. We wanted to gauge people's tolerance. And we asked them, how did knowing bears in the state improve? You know, how did that affect their enjoyment of living in the state? Did it increase? Did it have no effect? Did it decrease? We asked questions relating to population. Did people think there was too many, not enough, or the right number of bears in the state? Uh, as well as in their neighborhood, and they do they want to see more bears or do they want to see fewer bears? But when we we're looking at tolerance, what we actually found it was intolerance. So it was people had actually become intolerant in both the groups, whether it was high density or low density. 
We then went on to look at those questions involving the various different types of management. So using regulated hunting to reduce bear numbers, using uh, permits for agriculture. So farmers experiencing crop or livestock damage get special permits to remove bears and then removing bears that pose a threat to human health and safety. We got to factor on those modifying human behaviors. So teaching people ways to reduce the chances of bears getting into their garbage, uh, not feed enforce feeding bans on bears, and then just educating people on ways to reduce chances of having a conflict. And then again, those non-lethal options that we offered. So reproductive controls, which again, uh, were ruled out in the early 2000s at the, the scientific literature, whether you're talking about bears or deers, shows that it, it hasn't been effective for free ranging populations. So, you know, the wildlife that are just roaming around out in the forest, not in enclosed areas like fenced in areas or islands, trap and relocation, which we talked about, which is only going to be used for those urban bears, and then aversive conditioning or harassment techniques running the dogs on bears to try to discourage them from coming back to an area, using things that make loud noises to scare them, or hitting them with a rubber buckshot. So we did, used all these to put together what's called a structural equation model. And this is just a, a showing you what we're actually doing in the lab when we're actually writing all this out and running the different models. So we're looking at a couple of things in these structure equation models. We're looking at how experience predicts intolerance, how intolerance predicts management or doesn't predict management, as well as how experiences predict management directly. So you're gonna notice a couple of things about these graphs. The colors are gonna be green. So if some a green arrow is pointing to something, that means the one factor is predicting the factor that it's pointing to, and it's a positive influence, we call it. And then if it's red, it means it's not predicting it, or it's a negative influence. There's also going to be a different thickness to these. Lines. So the thicker the line is, the stronger the influence. And for those of you who are into the statistics, these uh, the numbers that you're going to see, which we're really not going to focus on, are standardized beta coefficients, so they go from a negative one to a positive one. Closer to a negative one or a positive one, the stronger the influence. So if we look here at our different experiences, feeling threatened, seeing bears and nuisance activity, you can see right away, seeing bears, which is often a positive experience for most of us, does not predict intolerance, right? That's what we see here represented by this red area. That's not surprising. But nuisance behavior and threats do actually predict intolerance. In fact, the greatest predictor of people becoming intolerant to bears, that's really where they want to see the same number of bears or fewer, was were those instances of feeling threatened. Now, when we get, we're looking at how the intolerance factor predicts management, again, the red arrow here. So intolerance is not a predictor of support for modifying human behaviors. And the red arrow that you see here in negative influence actually suggests that as people become intolerant, they actually, uh, the support for modifying human behaviors decreases. But we did see that intolerance predicted support for those non-lethal techniques and especially those lethal techniques, lethal management techniques. Now, we looked at these models for the low density group, the high density group, and we looked at all the data together. And what we found was the more data that we had, so the more experience that we had, you started seeing these relationships going directly from experience to support for lethal management. It didn't necessarily have to go through our intolerance factor anymore. So when people had these very strong experiences like feeling threatened, it was going right to support for lethal management. And just seeing bears, again, positive experience, positive predictor of support for modifying human behaviors. And when you put it all together, that's what it looks like. So you can see it gets pretty, it starts getting pretty crazy with all the lines and the numbers, which is why I wanted to break it down for you and kind of go through it bit by bit. And for any of you data nerds like me out there, this is what the model actually looks like when we're putting all the data in the computer. So these rectangles actually represent the individual survey questions. The round circles represent the seven factors that we talked about. 
in those arrows, when you see one factor pointing to another, it means it predicts it if the number associated with it is positive. So we also happen to do these surveys looking at people's experiences with white-tailed deer and Canada geese. And if you look over on the right here, we're looking at that tolerance bubble graph, bubble graph again. You can see it's very similar. In fact, for all three species where we looked, and these were 18 different townships throughout the state, people had become gotten to a point where they either wanted to see the same number or fewer of that particular species, particularly when we got to Canada geese. So what are kind of the, the big pictures that we learned from this? So as you get an increase in threats, damage, and nuisance behavior, so threatening experiences, bears getting into the garbage and bird feeders. With deer, it was actually fear of Lyme disease, uh, deer vehicle collisions, um, and residential landscape damage and agricultural damage. And when we got to the Canada geese, it was encountering excessive amounts of goose poop and fear of health concerns, associated health concerns. These were all strong predictors of people becoming intolerant for those three species. Now, once intolerant, this leads to support for the more aggressive, non-lethal uh, management, like uh, trap and relocation of an animal, or in the case of Canada geese, nest and egg destruction, or regulated hunting to reduce numbers, or actually going in and removing species that pose a threat to human safety. And again, threats, the more aggressive, the more aggressive the encounter or the experience or that threat, whether it was a deer vehicle collision, right? We have over 25,000 deer vehicle collisions in New Jersey a year. So aside from the safety issues, that's also insurance payments of about $100 million per year. A lot of people have concerns with deer ticks. Um, agricultural damage, I'm going to tell you in a couple of minutes about some of the studies we've looked at agricultural damage, but some of the farmers, it's been so bad, particularly with deer, they're questioning whether they can continue to go on. But the more negative the experience is, the stronger it is a predictor of support for more aggressive management options. So keeping in mind, when we're talking about management of wildlife, we're seeking a balance, right? We wanna balance healthy wildlife populations while minimizing negative impacts to forests, right? For example, deer uh, over browsing forest understories and facilitating uh, invasive species from coming in and taking over. Uh, we also wanna reduce uh, negative impacts to farmers and their livelihoods or other economic impacts, as well as reduce safety concerns. So it's really balance that we're talking about when we're talking about wildlife management. Now, I wanted to make you aware of some new resources that are available relating to wildlife and the way people and wildlife interact in the state that's up on the New Jersey Agricultural Experiment Station website. If you go to the NJAES website and you click on either commercial agriculture or natural resources in the environment, you'll see a link that says people and wildlife, which will take you to this new page that we just put up uh, a couple of months ago. Now, featured on this page, we have several videos that are showing some of our work using drones to monitor uh, local deer populations in Somerset County around the Rutgers Hutchinson Memorial Forest. Um, there's a segment uh, where we followed a farmer through an entire growing season where you could actually see the extreme impacts that deer had on his field where he lost 10 or 20 of his 40 acre cornfield to deer damage that year where they ate it right down almost to the ground, which allowed the, the ground to open up and weedy species like foxtail grew in and actually started out competing the corn. And we're actually uh, highlighting a community program that does deer management at the around uh, the Hutchinson Memorial Forest, not only involving deer fencing, but a community bow hunting program, which has reduced numbers of deer from before we started the program to 150 per square mile which is about 15 times the amount of deer we'd want to see in this area, down to more recently after four years of management, down to about 40 per square mile. 
Um, it's also been a great benefit to the Community Food Bank, where participants have donated over 13,000 serving the protein to the local food bank. Just last week, we released a report that was actually talking about these drone surveys that we did between the fall of 2019 and the spring of 2023. Again, where we're using those drones to look at count deer out there, develop population estimates, and we're tracking those numbers before and after the implementation of a deer management program. Now, what we've seen out there, the ecologists that have worked in the forest have seen a lot of invasive species. In fact, see Gene Epiphan here in the, the lower uh, left-hand corner with a lot of Japanese stilt grass in the background. So another plot over here on the right, this is what it looks like when all those invasive species were hand weeded and just the natives are remaining, but the ecologists working out there are starting to see a return of some native species and in greater numbers since the program began. We also have a new fact sheet up, up on the webpage about reducing black bear damage to farm operations. This also includes guidance on installing electric fence around compost piles or backyard gardens or beehives that may be of interest to some of you. And then a, a study that we did where we interviewed 27 farmers from North Central and Southern New Jersey, looking at the impacts of deer damage to their farm operations. Now, an interesting thing about these particular farms, if you see the graph here, you see the number 10 in red and a red dotted line going across the bar graph. That represents the number of deer that we would want to see in the area to balance kind of having uh, deer in the area with reducing negative agriculture and re reducing ecosystem damage. Now, these brown bars represent the individual farms and the deer per square mile that were counted during the surveys. So if you can see, deer per square mile in these particular farms goes from 60 to over 200 deer per square mile in these farms where they're experiencing these high levels of damage. So that's between six and 20 times what we would actually want to see. Now, if you look at the pie chart here, this is kind of a summary of some of the economic impacts that we found in this study. So the red part of the pie chart here, it's over $500,000. That's direct crop damage. That's what previous studies had looked at. It's how much, are the, how much corn, for example, are the deer eating? What's the cost that the farmer is losing? We were very interested in what's represented by the green here. And that's what we call hidden costs. This includes having to abandon fields where the deer pressure is so high. Um, it includes having to uh, abandon preferred crops and growing a crop that the farmer will make less money on, as well as any costs associated with implementing management techniques. For example, putting up a deer fence, or maybe increased use of fertilizers because not being able to rotate the crops on regular rotations, it causes damage to the soil. The farmers then have to go out and buy fertilizer. So just the cost, the negative impacts experienced from deer related costs to these 27 farmers was one point, about $1.3 million. If we added other wildlife damage and that was primarily uh, Canada geese and blackbirds, that was almost another $100,000. Now, these are the minimum estimates. The actual report that's up on the webpage includes the, the maximum estimates too, because they gave us an estimated range. One, you know, so, so what does all that mean? What does $1.3 million in damage mean for 27 farmers, right? It's kind of hard for us to grasp, grasp, right? One of our participants put it like this, the deer take 25% of every paycheck. Now imagine that, imagine somebody taking every two weeks, 25% right off the top of your paycheck. That's what some of these farmers are experiencing. And for some of them, it was worse than 25%. If you look at the photographs here, um, this is basically, you can see on the left-hand side, the students standing in front of corn that hadn't been damaged, you can see it goes up over their head and the foreground is waist high or below. This is uh, deer damage in Somerset County. On the right, we're looking at soybean damage. We're inside this little fenced off area. That's what the field should look like. It should be up around waist high. 
but the deer have actually eaten it down to knee high. So it's a tremendous loss for these farmers. And a lot of times when, you know, we may be driving by these types of fields, you're going to think, oh, it's a green field. It's, you know, it's healthy. It's good. The crop is doing well. You don't realize maybe these subtle changes that represent these devastating impacts that the farmers around the state, help people that help us put food on our table are experiencing. Some of the people that we talk to are from multi-generational farm families that it's gotten so bad they're questioning whether they continue, can continue to farm. So it's gotten bad. So whenever we're invited, we like to share the results of our research and the projects that we're doing. The study that I just talked about with the deer damage, we've been invited twice to present the results to that, to the Assembly uh, Agriculture and Food Security Committee. We've also been invited out to speak to various town councils about the research and deer management and monitoring activities. And keep your eye out, something that's going to be coming this summer is a very similar study to what we just described to bear damage and how that impacts farmers' livelihoods. In this one, we surveyed a couple hundred farmers in central and northern Jersey. And so far, in looking at the preliminary data, we're seeing similar trends to what we saw with the deer study. Whereas with just about 75 farmers right now that had experienced damage, it's about $600,000 in direct crop damage and an additional $600,000 plus in those hidden type costs like abandoning fields, abandoning preferred crops, and management-related costs. So that full study study report is going to be out this summer and available on the NJAES website. So with that, I just wanted to quickly acknowledge a few people. The Berryman Institute and the Northeast uh, Fish and Wildlife Damage Management Cooperative, who provided funding for some of our research activities. Uh, photo credits for the state uh, DEP uh, fish and Wildlife, as well as Rutgers Cooperative Extension and the National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration. Colleagues involved in the human and wild or human and bear interactions research that I talked about today: Jason Grabowski, Bill Holman, Brooke Maslow, and Pierce Mouse, as well as colleagues at DEP Fish and Wildlife, New Jersey Farm Bureau. Rutgers Cooperative Extension, and the Hutchinson Memorial Forest, who all participated in various projects that I just told you all about. And a special thanks to our survey reviewers from Cornell and Penn State, and Edgar Paul Curtis, Meredith Gore, who's now at University of Maryland, Bill Seamer, and Gary San Julian. And with that, I'm happy to answer any questions. And this bear you see here is actually a bear we had up on Cook Campus almost two years ago. It was in a poplar tree over by the Eagleton Institute. That was great. Thank you. I, I especially liked the, um, the presentation and the discussion about the model. I thought that was really well done. You know, it's tough to, tough to convey that stuff to an audience. Well, so, it was pretty interesting. And again, Sal, like the way that our study differed from previous studies, it was not only from the experience aspect, but it was also how experience and intolerance predicted support for management. That had never been done in previous studies. So pretty right. cool stuff. I think so. So if people do have questions, you can type them into the Q&A. Um, Again, that's the the button with the two little speech bubbles. So I don't I don't see any questions at the moment, uh, but I have a couple. Um, you had a picture of some bear cubs, and you mentioned they were about one year old, and then um, you said when they were born they might be one pound. How big are they after a year? In a year, they're probably between you know eighty and a hundred pounds. Those ones that we saw in the photo, those would be, you know, yearlings are really approaching about a year and a half right before the, the sow is going to chase them out to find their own ranges. So they were probably between 130 and 150 pounds there. All right. Big little cubs. We do have some questions coming in. Um, first question, where are the bears relocated to? 
So bears are only going to be relocated if it, it's a bear that's, you know, can't get out of an urban type situation, right? Where there's not suitable habitat for it. In that case, the fish and wildlife biologists will go in, capture it if they can, for example, using that barrel trap, green barrel trap type trap that we saw. And if they're able to catch it, then they would uh, relocate it to the nearest wildlife management area. But other than that, if a bear is just wandering into somebody's neighborhood, they're just going to let it go. And, you know, it'll typically find its way out the same way it found its way in. How long do bears generally live? Do they travel very far? They're, well, those are two great questions. They, there have been bears documented in New Jersey that have lived over 20 years. Um, and as far as how far they travel, a sow is typically going to stay within about a three square mile range. Males can travel much farther, go across several ranges, especially during the summer breeding season when they're looking for females. I know that there have been uh, bears in New Jersey that have been tracked traveling over 100 miles. All right. Did the state get accurate bear population numbers to base the bear hunts on? And is there a minimum number that would preclude a hunt? Are there, Their numbers are absolutely accurate. They've been doing uh, population research for about 40, 40 years now. Um, the current estimate and any estimates that you see, the most recent ones about 300 or 3,000 3, bears rather, those only represent the bears in the study areas up north of 80 and west of 287. So that doesn't, those estimates don't include every bear in the state. And as far as managing for a particular number, you're not managing for a particular number of bears. Ideally, what you're doing is managing to minimize the number of conflict situations with people, right? Or um, agricultural damage, things like that. So you wanna try to find a balance. Now, as far as each particular hunt, it's they have a percentage of the tagged bears from that year where if they reach that percentage, then the hunt would be closed down immediately. So it's something that's very closely monitored by the uh, DEP fish and wildlife biologists. Great question. Do relocated bears return to where they live? They can. In fact, the... Um, the bear that I was talking about, and this was, boy, it had to have been about 20 years ago. It had been moved about 100 miles, and it went right back. So found found its way back all that way. In New Jersey, are there cases of bears maiming or severely injuring people? So it's not common for a black bear to get aggressive with people. Um, they usually don't want anything to do with people. You know, oftentimes bears have good sense of, of hearing. Oftentimes if they hear you coming, say if you're out hiking in the forest, they're just going to be on their way. That said, sometimes there are aggressive bears and attacks. And unfortunately, about 10 years ago, there was a fatality of a Rutgers student. And I believe that was the first fatality in New Jersey in over 100 years. But you do hear it about it periodically around the country from places where there are black bears. So what you would do in the extreme rare case that a bear were to attack you would be with a black bear, you would fight back as much as you could, try to hit it in the nose, try to hit it in the eyes. You would basically just keep hitting it until it left you alone. But again, very rare that somebody's gonna get attacked by a black bear, but it does happen. Related to that comment, uh, would you recommend people carry bear spray? I think that's a, I, I'm, I don't know if it's legal in New Jersey right now. Most, I, I wouldn't carry bear spray myself. Most people I know who have used bear spray have gotten it worse than the bear did. Hmm. Uh, why don't reproductive controls work on bears? There's a couple of reasons. A drug that they were doing studies on in the early 2000s, um, it was they were injecting the, the testes of males with a drug called neuterzol. Now, a, a couple of reasons. There's 
it changes the you know demeanor so to speak of the bear when they do that so that's one knock against it but the biggest thing is bears aren't the easiest animal to catch in fact if you've ever done wildlife research regardless of the species it's difficult to catch them so to catch enough of the animals where you would be able to treat them if there was a drug that was you know deemed uh effective which there isn't it would just be prohibitive cost and time prohibitive to do it in fact when they did those tests in the early 2000s those were done with captive bears now what you hear about very regularly with deer reproductive controls the science doesn't support that they work and this is de decades of research Usually when people point to limited success that is in the scientific literature, what they'll fail to recognize is that those are deer that are either on island populations or are fenced in research animals. So there's not animals moving in and out of system like we have out in nature. So they've been shown to be ineffective and then they're extremely um, high in cost. In fact, deer reproductive controls you would typically be talking around $1,000 or more per animal. And in some cases, depending on whether you, if you were using drugs, for example, and it was something that had to be retreated, you would then have to capture that same animal multiple times and retreat it, which, you know, would be almost impossible. A couple of questions on populations. Um, are bear populations increasing in other states too, or just New Jersey? Um, I, they're much higher in New York and Pennsylvania. I don't know the current status of those two states right now, whether they're increasing or whether they've been stabilized. I know where my family is from outside of Buffalo and New York. In recent years, they have had bears wander into neighborhoods where they live. So I don't know about the overall numbers for New York, but I know that the they're being spotted in areas they haven't been spotted in previously. And on that note, are bears moving into South Jersey and do they get close to the shore? Um, they're, they're more wandering. Usually if you see bears that are that far South, it might be a yearling. So like one of those year and a half year old bears that's being forced out looking to find its own range, or it could be uh, in the fall time where sometimes it'll extend their own ranges looking for food to fatten up before they go into the den. But there's not a not thought to be a, a large population of bears down in South Jersey. Okay. But there have been sightings. Well, here's a fun one. Uh, can bear cubs be domesticated? No. <laughs> in the in the set, they're I mean they're they're wildlife, so you would never want to go take bear cubs and try to bring it home with you. They grow quite quickly, and you know even at some of the photos where you saw cubs that were about teddy bear size, they already have even sharp claws then, but. They're going to grow really fast, and it's also illegal. So, uh, you mentioned the idea of using dogs to harass bears. Um, what what's a typical outcome of that? Do the bears just go away from that area, or do they try to interact uh, with the dog? Mike Madonia, who's the the current Black Bear Project leader, he's previously done a study with aversive conditioning so they do keep the bears out for maybe a, a couple of weeks but eventually he found at least in his research that over time they were coming back and the state is to my knowledge the state no longer has bears in uh in service right now or dogs rather and those dogs right. uh black mouth yellow curs so if any of you have ever seen Old Yeller, it's the same type of dog Old Yeller was. Um, how do you secure a trash can? You can, if you go to Fish and Wildlife webpage, 
they actually have information where you can buy bear resistant garbage cans. So they're they're cans that you know specially sealed that are sturdier and more resistant to bears. Now, I'm not going to say bear proof because even those bear resistant cans sometimes you get a big bear that'll just you know tip it over and jump on it till it pops it open. But the bear resistant cans that are going to give you more success in keeping bears out of the garbage, they have uh, where you can buy them up on the Fish and Wildlife webpage. All right. And there, there is a famous anecdote. I don't know if it's true about, um, I think it was somebody in the U.S. Forest Service was asked about bear-proof trash cans and basically said it's difficult to design a trash can um, where humans are intelligent enough to open it, but bears are not. All right, we've still got a, quite a few questions. We'll try to get through most of these. Um, how about air horns? instead of bear spray um, and whistles, a bear sure. whistle? I mean, whistle. Whistles are, you know, if you're out hiking and you were to, you know, periodically blow a whistle, that could be a way to let a uh, bear know that you were coming. So it would be out of the area before you even get there. Speaking loudly, putting, you know, tying bells to your boots. Those are other things that people have done over the years. Air horns are something you can try in a backyard situation. To, it's coming into your, your property and you want to scare it away. You can try with bear horn or an air horn. Um, it's probably going to have success in the beginning. The thing you'd have to watch out for is over time, if they realize that nothing, you know, negative is following up that horn, it may render it ineffective. But it's definitely something that's worth trying and people try up in bear country. There was also a comment um that it's a good idea if you know there is a mother bear with cubs to avoid them in particular. Sure, you, you always want to stay away from any bear, right? We say that you want to appreciate them from afar. So if you see a bear, you know, you want to be respectful, keep a good distance, back away, try not to make eye contact. Now, sometimes what it what happens is a bear may do things to let you know that you're too close to it. It may make like a woofing sound at you, like, or pop its jaws at. Those are uh, bear behaviors letting you know that it's not happy and that you need to back off. Um, sometimes they will slam their paw on the ground. That's kind of another indicator. And that you know, slapping of the ground, its paw, is sometimes followed up uh, with a bluff charge, right? Bluff charge is when a bear runs at you full speed and then stops. Now, what gets really intimidating about that is you don't know it's a bluff until they actually stop. So <laughs> it can be pretty pretty scary when it happens, especially for the first time. But if a bear is approaching you, if you're in a group of people, the best thing to do is move closer together, try to look big. Um, if it's doing something like bluff charging, you can do you know, jumping jacks and start yelling at it, get away from me, bear, get away from me, bear. And usually they're just going to back off in that case. But again, just slowly, without making eye contact, if you can, just back away and get out of the area. All right. Um, are there any statistics on black bear and domestic animal conflicts? Uh, sure. You can see them up on the New Jersey Fish and Wildlife website. They put out bear activity reports every month. So I believe they have them up there for the last 20 years right now. So that'll include anything from bear sightings to agricultural damage to livestock damage like bear you know, attacking uh, sheep or uh, cattle or horses, as well as uh, pet, att pet attacks. So there's, and I believe they break it down into provoked and unprovoked. So example, if a dog goes after a bear and the bear attacks it, that's a provoked attack versus the bear just seeing, you know, a small dog maybe as a prey item and coming in and going after the dog. We've got a couple more questions. Um, but one thing, as you mentioned, that, that comes to mind, how about like all those cute videos we see online of bears like playing in the pool or playing on the swing set in someone's backyard? Uh, I mean, it, it definitely happens, especially in the summertime. They're They've got dense black fur and they love to 
cool off in water, right? So a lot of times out in the forest, there'll be little areas that collect water. It's called like a, a wallow where the bears will go in and, and cool off and hang out. But yeah, if they come across a pool or a, a koi pond, yeah, they, they absolutely may go for a dip to, to cool off. Um, so here's a here's a question about the management techniques in New Jersey in general. Um, so how extensive is the lethal management versus any of the, the non-lethal approaches? I think that's the heart of the question. There's been a very extensive education campaign going back for more than 20 years now um, to educate people about storing their their garbage properly to do things like if you are going to feed birds don't feed them in the time of year when you know uh, bears are most active so pretty much from now until november if you are going to feed birds during that uh, time frame you know only feed them during the day and take the feeders in at night keep your backyard grills um, clean every time after you use it, clean them because the bears might come in and, and smell the grease and, and go after um, the grills. So there's been that extensive education campaign. And then the lethal management is to try to keep that population stable, right? So that started out with um, six day bear season in December, it corresponds with six day firearm season. And then, um, you know, several years ago, they initiated a fall bow season, right? And those seasons are very closely monitored. But, you know, we're fortunate that we have a very large black bear population in New Jersey that can withstand hunting, right? Um, but we want to try to regulate that population to minimize the negative interactions that bears are having with people. And if you look in the... Um, the 2002 uh, Black Bear Management Plan that's up on Fish and Wildlife's webpage, they actually have kind of a neat graph where you can see like the years that there's hunts, the number of conflicts the following year will go down. Years where there's not hunts, you're typically going to see those conflict situations going back up again. So the line kind of, the lines mirror each other. So they, you know, it's been a very successful program now for more than 20 years. Do you suppose there's anything cultural with the bears with that? Like they know now humans are dangerous or is it just a matter of reducing the numbers? Um, I, I think in the areas where I've been with wildlife, where there's hunting taking place, they'll learn over time to avoid those areas. Mm -hmm. But again, it, it, it's just going to, Depend. There's there's still a, a, lot, a lot of bears up there in northern New Jersey. When we're talking about the deer, we have a lot of deer all over the state outside of the urban areas. So there's always going to be a lot of human and wildlife contact. These hunting seasons are a traditional management technique that's used, that's cost, of, cost effective to try to stabilize those populations and maintain that balance that we talked about where you're minimizing the negative impacts while still ensuring that you have healthy wildlife populations. Okay, and our final question tonight, um, what are your thoughts on making deer meat from hunting available for commercial sale? Or I guess in other ways to use it as well. There's, um, there's, there's definitely, you know, people who have proposed that they do that again. Uh, market hunting was actually one of the things that led to the extirpation of deer in the northeastern United States in the you know the early 1900s. Arguably one of the most successful wildlife reintroduction stories in history. To now we're at the point where in you know many areas around New Jersey have 60 or more per square mile. Um, with the deer management program that I've been involved with for the last, uh, you know, more than four years now, I really like the benefit that the participants donating the venison to the local food bank. Um, it's been extremely helpful for the Franklin Food Bank in Somerset County that we work with. We set up a system where 
the participants can just drop the deer off of the butcher. It gets paid for, and then the food bank comes and picks it up. It's fed over, you know, 13,000 meals. And they told us, especially during COVID, they really needed that extra protein. And it was, it was a huge help. So I like the, I'd like to see venison opportunities for venison donation programs to help those in need and communities expand. Uh, when you said it was paid for, does that mean the, the hunter gets paid? No, the hunter doesn't get paid. The butcher gets paid for butchering the deer and the, the butcher would give us a discounted rate to actually butcher the deer. All right. So still a, a positive program. Oh, absolutely. Okay, so I think that's all the questions we have. Um, normally, I would encourage our listeners to complete the poll, but everyone online has completed it. So kudos to all you who did. We do appreciate your um, your your. We do appreciate you completing that poll and the feedback you give us on these programs. So if there is nothing else, I will thank our speaker, Joe Paulin. That was an excellent presentation. I certainly learned a lot. Um, All right. Thanks, everyone. My pleasure. Okay. Thank you.